Now tell me, what does a day in the life of the Supreme Allied Commander look sure. like? From the time you wake up, I know you guys don't <coughs> sleep in like the rest of us uh, in New York, waking up at 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. No, oh, yeah. it's not California. Sure. Uh, with all due respect to my friends in California. You guys wake up. Tell, tell us, from sure. the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep, because just talking to other friends uh, on the Chief's staff, yeah. they never sleep. It's, it's one of your talents. It's a gene you're born with. You don't need to take coffee. You don't go to sleep. <laughs> Tell me what happens yeah. in the course of a day. Um, you get up around, well, first of all, your head, here's the good news. Your headquarters is in Belgium, and it's in southern Belgium, south of Brussels, in a small town called Mons. So it's a very uh, bucolic setting, and your headquarters is, it's kind of the Pentagon of NATO. And um, you live in a beautiful home maybe 10 minutes away from it. So you're not dealing with a lot of uh, sand in the gears of day-to-day -day life, if you will. So you get up about six. I spent from six to seven uh, reading, really looking at um, high-end, highly classified material, trying to kind of prepare for the day. From seven to eight, I would typically work out. At eight o'clock, I'd jump in a car. I'd be at my headquarters at about, uh, about 8, 10, and then the day kind of split into either a travel day, and I was on the road about 60% of the time, or an uh, office day, if you will, in the headquarters. A travel day, I would hop in a helicopter, there's a helicopter pad right there, fly to a jet in Brussels, and then go to one of the either 28 NATO countries, uh, to one of the 22 nations that were in our coalition in Afghanistan. I would go to Afghanistan. I would go to the Balkans. I would go uh, any of the places where NATO operations were being conducted. And then that day became a very operational day, Joe, where I would meet with the generals and admirals who were leading. I'd also meet the most junior people, try and understand how the mission felt uh, on the deck plates of a ship, in the high country, in a flight, I'd fly in the AWACS or whatever the aircraft was. So about 60% of the days were like that, and 40% were days that would be familiar to anybody. They were uh, meetings, discussions, uh, planning, 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 developing ideas, and those office days also spent a lot of time in video conferences back to uh, NATO headquarters in Washington or working with my civilian leadership. Um, typically a day, an office day, would end at about 7, go home, have a glass of scotch, kind of talk to my wonderful wife, and then frankly hit the emails, which you just don't have a chance to do in the course of the day. That runs you till 10, and then from kind of 10 to midnight is when I take time uh, to read non-military, non-intelligence, to read novels. Uh, I love to read fiction. I love to read poetry. I, I love to totally break from the day by reading something entirely different. So that's a typical day, and it, it, it bifurcated into operational on-the-road days or in the office days. And how does that change? How does a day look differently when there's a, th a threat or a crisis yeah. that happens? A Russian jet yeah. shoots down a NATO plane, God forbid. Yeah. Something, something, uh, and during your time, there were threats and crises. Oh, constantly. What, how does it look different? Yeah. Well, uh, in, the, in the heart of my time as the NATO commander, I was NATO commander from 2009 to 2013. So in the middle of that was Libya. So during the Libyan crisis, which ran about seven months or so, our battle rhythm was, uh, combat briefings two to three times a day, uh, video conferences with leadership twice a day, once with NATO, once with the United States. Um, and there was interestingly less travel in that period because you had to focus on making the big strategic and operational decisions about the campaign. So in those days of crisis, you, you tend to be very locked into the headquarters so you can react to the challenges. And it becomes more of a struggle to get out of the headquarters, although it's all that much more important 
to get to where your troops and sailors and airmen are actually operating.